Hey guys, it's Sensuki, and welcome to part 3 of my beginner's guide to Pillars of Eternity. This part will be a shorter part than the last one, and will focus on combat and gameplay. Before I begin, there are several things that I forgot to cover in my last video, and there is also a minor thing that I wanted to address that I saw in another video. Before I do that, I'll load the save that I had before. Okay, so I, I saw a guide on online by a um, content creator called Quill18, and he was going over how recovery time works, and uh, there was a minor um, issue with the way he described it, and that, that is the way that um, recovery time is calculated. So I think he was looking at a weapon, and he said that the animation of the weapon was one second long, so that, that's the animation speed of... Um, normal one-handed weapons, or average speed one-handed weapons, and the animation speed of melee two-handed weapons. However, the recovery time for those weapons is not uh, one second, because Pillars of Eternity has a global recovery multiplier, which is not documented in the game, and it was not provided in the press release um, information as well, so there's no way that he could have known about it, because I've actually been digging around um, in the modding scene, um, and I've actually been following a lot of the developer posts online. Uh, that's how I know about it. So what I actually explained it in my first video and um, The recovery time for a weapon of that type will actually be 36 frames Which is 30 times 1.2 and then um, when you, if when you're slowed down uh, by something else like uh, for instance if you're wielding a two-handed weapon um, it'll be it'll be 36 frames and then plus 50% of that, so it'll actually be 54 frames. And if you're wearing armor, like plate mail, it'll slow that down again by half of the base value, so slow it down by another 18 frames. So that's not Quill's fault. Um, that's just Obsidian didn't provide any information about that. It's not a big deal because it's only, it's the same for everybody. So um, even though that the actual value in frames or seconds will be incorrect um, from the poster or whatever that they put out, um, the characters will act, still act at the same speed. Okay, so there's a, a few things that I forgot to show um, during my last part because there's just so many systems in the game and I've, um, I wrote down a list of those and then once I've done that, I'll get into, um, I'll show off some dialogue, how to, how to use, um, how to interact with shops and then I'll get into exploration, gameplay and combat. Okay, so the first thing I forgot to showcase was how to equip items, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I'll go into the stash here. So basically, just to equip an item, you just click on it in the inventory and drag it onto the item slot. The item slot will highlight. So for the armor, you just pick it up. You can also put it on anywhere in this window here if you want to equip any, any, any item in this slot. It doesn't work for weapon sets though. So you can just drag it onto the character model, like that. And that works the same for anything here, it'll just override it. And there's also a comparison window, as you can see when you mouse over an item. On the right side tooltip will show the one that's in your inventory, and the left side tooltip shows the one that's equipped, and it shows the difference between them. Something I also forgot to talk about um, regarding armor in the last um, video is that even though um, heavier armors give you better damage reduction, they're uh, not necessarily the best to wear, and... Um, I find that on tank characters, it's best to wear the heaviest armor possible in most or pretty much all situations. For melee characters that aren't necessarily tanking, it's good to either wear like lighter armor or maybe even no armor. And for ranged characters, I don't wear any armor at all because there's just no point. If you're not getting attacked, there's no reason to slow down your recovery speed. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is that all classes can wear any armor or use any weapon. There's no weapon restrictions and no armor restrictions. Wizards can wear plate mail, although that is generally a very bad idea, even though the developers often say it's cool. It's not. Um, there are a couple of item restrictions. For instance, only wizards can use grimoires. And there are a few class-specific magic items and stuff like that. There's amulets that only chanters can wear. I think there's belts that only, or gloves that only paladins can wear. Stuff like that. But it's not that drastic. Pretty much, it, for about 95 to 96 percent of items in the game, every character can use it. Um, I also for, forgot to talk about the quick item system. Um, did yes. I pick up any stuff? 
in the last video. No. So I think I looted this chest. Yes. Okay, so I've picked up a potion from this chest. Now, you can equip these potions uh, and consumables in your quick item slots. You can put scrolls in here and consumables. That, uh, that's how... Um, and you, you chuck it in the slot, and then when you What's have you the need? character mm -hmm. selected in the UI, it actually shows up in the action bar. So if you want to use that, you just click on it in the action bar. Potion, potions, um, the character plays an animation, and then on, I think they play a recovery time as well, I'm not sure. And um, any character can use scrolls, so you can chuck... You just have to have one point in lore to be able to use level 1 scrolls. So you just put those in your quick item slots. There's a talent that unlocks the other two quick item slots, so I don't really think it's necessary. Four is pretty, um, pretty good for every character. Another thing that I forgot to talk about is the suppression system, um, which is hard to explain because I can't actually remember the exact values, but basically what, what there is a suppression system in Pillars of Eternity to prevent buff and debuff stacking. So there is a bunch of rules that I'll probably paste a link to in the description or something because I don't have them on hand where um, if you cast two spells that um, both give you bonus deflection, it will only use the value of the high, of the spell that gives more deflection, and um, the current the lower level one will be suppressed unless the duration of the high level one runs out. It's still there, it's just not being used because it's being overridden by the more powerful one. And um, this also happens for debuffs, um, and it also happens for... Um, Bonuses from items and stuff like that. If you have two items that are giving a bonus to the same attribute, only the highest level bonus will be used. And this works a bit differently for some things, such as, um, I think, DR and maybe accuracy. You can get accuracy from a couple of different sources, but there is a limit on um, how many sources you can have applying an accuracy bonus at once. Like, if you have a buff from a spell... Um, a magical property from a weapon and maybe one item giving a bonus to accuracy, they will all stack. But as soon as you start stacking um, uh, uh, bonuses from the same uh, category, then they won't they won't stack. They'll override each other. So that it, the suppression system has a lot of... Um, the, it's fairly straightforward, but I don't have it on hand at the moment because the only existence of how the suppression system works is a forum post in a now deprecated something awful thread by the lead designer Josh Toyer. So I'll pull that out after I've uploaded the video and put it in the video link. I also forgot to showcase defenses um, and explain how, how they work. So there's four defenses in Pillars of Eternity. Deflection, which you can see the mouse um, over thing. Fortitude, Reflex and Will. Deflection is the defense that is attacked probably 75 to 85% of the time. And that is, deflection covers pretty much all weapon attacks, so ranged and melee attacks, pretty much anything that actually targets the character that's using a weapon. The other ones are the secondary defenses. Reflex covers all area of effect spells. Fortitude is for stuff like poison, getting knocked prone, and things like that. And will is for mental attacks. Um, or things that drop mental stats and stuff like that. Now, um, I've already explained how you get the... The classes all have an inherent base bonus to all defenses. I can't remember what the exact value is for every class. I think it's on the wiki, the Pillars of Eternity wiki, but the developers have actually changed the values in the press version from the version in the last backer beta because they've been tuning it. So I have a wizard here, and she, she has a base deflection of 10, but um, some of these stats here are modi modified by my attributes. And they've actually lowered the defenses and raised the um, class accuracy or something like that. Um, and you can get, uh, you can raise your deflection through wearing a shield, various talents. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, the secondary defenses you can raise through getting bonus attributes. There's also talents that raise them, and there's a few other ways to to do that as well. And you also get. Plus three to every defense every time you level up, and you also get plus three to accuracy every time you level up. So they do it does scale with level. Um, I also forgot to talk about minimum damage. Um, so if I go into the weapon and uh, highlight the damage tooltip, it does say in the tooltip, I think there's like a minimum damage rule. It says in one of the things here. Strange. It doesn't actually say a. Um, minimum damage thing in there. I know there was one tooltip that actually explained how it worked. Maybe it was DR. 
Yeah, there we go. So it says um, there's a minimum damage rule. So if you roll 10 damage and the enemy has a higher DR than 10 or higher DR than um, w what your minimum damage is, you'll you'll do at least uh, two damage because that's 20% of um, that's that's like 20% minimum damage. So you always deal at least 20% of your rolled damage, which is not too bad. Um, it's important for when you're using light weapons and stuff. Yes. Um, I also forgot to show one of the weapons in the game, which is an Arbalist. Um, I will have to enable cheats to do that. So, to enable cheats in the game, you type in I roll 20s. This disables Steam achievements for the playthrough. And then the code to um, summon an item is add item. And I want to add in, I want to summon an Arbalist. So, I'm going to do that. Okay, so this is an Arbalist. And um, they have actually changed this weapon in this build. Now, the special property of an Arbalist is it can actually knock p uh, enemies prone when it scores a critical hit. And that's actually very strong because when you score a critical, it will roll an attack, um, I think, against Fortitude or something like that. And if they fail it, they get knocked prone. So it can happen quite often on crits. And like guns, they also do less crit damage. So Arbalists are pretty cool, and that, that change to the knocking them prone was only added in in the press patch. It wasn't uh, here in the last, um, in the back of beta. And I also said in the by accident in the last video that the Warbow is faster than the Hunting Bow. That's not true, the Hunting Bow is faster than the Warbow. And the other thing I forgot to just, the last thing that I forgot to talk about is weapon styles. Now there are three um, different weapon styles in Pillars of Eternity, single-handed, uh, or single wielding, dual wielding, and two handed. So when this is considered two handed with a range, range weapon, technically ranged is a fourth style, but it's also classed as two handed. So when you're single wielding, um, it, this counts as uh, single wielding because Grimoire is an offhand thing. You get a plus eight to accuracy. Apparently, that's what it's showing me there. That's actually been nerfed. It used to be plus 10, so I don't know what they're going on about there. Um, but you get a you get a bonus to accuracy for single wielding, but your recovery time is the, the same as wielding a two-handed weapon, basically. So if you're... It's, like, slowed down by 50%. So the, my, my recovery time here, I'm wearing no armor. I'd have an attack animation of 30 frames and a recovery of 54 frames. If I equip a second weapon, uh, my recovery time is not slowed. So uh, it will be... I'll have... Make one attack with the mace, it will take uh, one second to make that attack. Then I'll have a 36 frame recovery, which um, is just over one second. And then I'll make a weapon attack with the sword, which is one second long. And then the same recovery, because they're both uh, average speed weapons. And um, when, you're wielding a fa when you're wielding a fast weapon, it will do the 20 times 1.2 instead. So the fastest way to attack is actually to dual wield. That, that is the, the fastest way to attack. One-handed is the same as wielding a two-handed weapon such as an S-Doc. Two-handed weapons, um, they do more damage by default. Uh, two we two dual wielding is faster, and wielding a single-handed weapon is more accurate. But currently, I don't think uh, wielding a single weapon is very good. I think it's the most underpowered weapon style in the game. So I would probably recommend not using a single weapon. Oh, the other one I forgot to showcase is shield. I need to summon one of those as well. Add item large... Shield. I can't remember. I think it's small shield one. No. Maybe I'll buy a shield. Yes. Um, so I'll showcase that now. So merchants in the game, um, to to buy something, you have to actually talk to someone. Uh, the shop is in inter is um, shops. Uh, you have to talk to people, like in other RPGs, like uh, Diablo Two or something like that. You have to actually initiate dialogue with somebody yes. to access their store. What you do that is you how to initiate dialogue is you click on the character, and it brings up the dialogue screen. Now, if a character is a special NPC like Hyoden is here, their portrait will show on the left side of the dialogue window. Uh, the dialogue window you can also expand and contract, but currently you can't reset the dialogue size to the default. Um, now, th what the, what happens in dialogue when you talk to people a lot of the time in Pillars of Eternity that didn't happen in Baldur's Gate 1 or 2 but did happen in Planescape Torment is there will be a description about what the person is doing because um, this description can't be conveyed uh, through the game because it's not a cinematic game, so they describe what the character is doing. And that, this is done in a different colour of text to their actual dialogue. 
Brought a whole wagon full of goods to sell, but not enough shirts for the road. Okay, so as you can see here, there there is a, a sort of grayed out text, which is the description text, and the white text is what he's actually saying. Say, is there anything you need? I've got some basic traveling supplies for sale, if you'd like to take a look. And uh, to select a dialogue option, you either just click on it or press the associated hotkey, which, uh, that, that, which is the reason why they are numbered. So we want to um, go to the store. I'm not going to bother with the dialogue for spoiler purposes. So the obvious line is, let's see what you've got. This brings up the shop interface, which I think is getting a revamp for the day one patch. Now, as you can see in the shop interface, on the left side, it has item filters. So if you click on that, it'll gray out the item, like in the inventory. Um, sometimes merchants have different, different types of stores. So this one is just a, a weapon shop. The, the inn also has several tabs down here. And you, you can scroll down with either the, holding the mouse wheel over the, uh, over the window or over the scroll bar to see what the items are. You can also right click on them to bring up the item description. And this is how much they cost. It's always displayed in copper pieces. Your inventory is showed here. And you can um, go to the party. You can flick between the party and the stash through this icon. So you can also sell stuff directly from your stash. So I've, got, I've summoned a bunch of weapons with cheats. So what I'm going to do is you can just drag the item or you can click on it. And you can also send them back. And um, this you're not limited to this amount of boxes. It does actually go down. So if I put all of these on there, as you can see, uh, some arrows have appeared here and I can scroll down. So that's how you sell, and then you just click trade. Uh, if you want to actually make a trade and buy some items, as you can see here, he's got most of the weapons and armor sets available in the game, but not everything. He does, I, think, I don't think he has any guns or anything like that. No arbalists, none of the powerful stuff. So if you want to buy something, say like a potion of minor regeneration, you just click it, it comes in the menu down here, and then you could press trade. Now if you have items down here, it will actually trade for the value. So if you don't have enough gold in your inventory, it will actually trade the value of the items in the same screen. So it speeds up the buying and selling process a little bit. So you press trade, uh, the item is removed from the vendor's inventory. The items are removed from all down here, and the trade button is now um, unclickable. And then you just close the store, I believe, and dialogue is now ended. Okay, so now we want to go adventuring. First, I'm going to show you how to loot containers, which I've already done before. So to loot a container, um, you can hold down the tab key, and that will bring up all of the available interactables in the game, as well as every unit tooltip. So holding down tab, you can see that in the Fog of War, there is a couple of interactable containers over here. There's an um, Ardra pillar with an item description, and it also shows everyone's name, which I actually find quite annoying because it, um, I don't I don't like seeing all the names of the people. I, I just like seeing them on mouse over. So um, to click on uh, interactables, you just click on it, and it brings up a text with like a shadowy background so that you can actually see it against the environment. To click on a container, uh, you basically just click on it. This is a locked container. When you mouse over a locked container, it will bring up a tooltip telling you how many mechanics you need to open the lock. Um, if you don't have the high, high enough mechanics to open it, you can use lock picks, which is an item I believe I have in my inventory. Or I think I actually, you can actually buy some from the vendor. So I think you need a certain amount of lock picks uh, for each point that you're under, under the mechanics um, threshold. Once you're too many points under, you can't actually pick the lock. So here, I, I think I have enough mechanics, or one of my characters does. So I can unlock the chest. And you also get experience for unlocking chests, which I'm not a fan of. I prefer no track and lock XP like in Baldur's Gate 1 and Icewind Dale 1. And then you just open it, it brings up the loot description thing. And I've already showed how to use this. So what have we got here? Potion of Minor Endurance, which gives me plus 50 Endurance. Now in Pills of Eternity at the moment, potions give a lot more healing than uh, any healing spells do, which I don't really like. So that's something that I have a bit of a gripe with. Okay, so now let's go exploring. So as you can see, there's a when you explore it, clears the Fog of War. Now, I, I remember watching... I was watching Anthony Davis' stream uh, the other day when he was playing... Oh, this is a crafting ingredient, so if I hold down my mouse, it will highlight the crafting ingredient in a white shader. When you click on that, it brings up a um, little pop-up here with the icon and tells you what crafting ingredient it is, and then in the combat log, it tells you that it's been added to the stash. So if I go into the inventory and go into the stash and then go to the crafting screen, 
it will show um, the item in here. Now these these are used in crafting potions, um, and I think enchantments as well. I'm not sure if um, ingredients are explicit like that, whether they're only used for one or the other. That's a story thing that I'm not going to bother interacting with. Okay, so now I am going to look for somebody to fight. Okay, so skip the story guy. I'll also showcase dialogue with Kalisha as well. And there's like an outcropping that you've got to find Let's to find some berries. Yep, here we go. Okay, so now we're in combat. And the very first, first thing that you should do in combat every single time you're in combat is pause the game. If you have an auto-pause setting, you probably want to have it to auto-pause on enemy sided. Now when you come into vision of an enemy, combat begins. The combat music should start playing and you should see a bunch of shit paste into the combat log over here. Um, which I'm in the wrong window. Nope. So nothing's actually come up yet, but usually what will happen is if characters have um, abilities and stuff that activate in combat, it will paste into the combat log. And when you've got a lot of characters uh, in your party, there'll be like 20 different lines that paste into the log at the start of combat. So it'll be pretty obvious when um, combat begins. Now, what you should actually do in combat that I didn't demonstrate because I'm an idiot is stealth around. So I already knew there were wolves here. What I should have done is gone into stealth mode and allow myself to set up on the wolves so I could get advantageous positioning. In now, Right now, I'm in a bit of a pickle. My wizard is in front of my fighter. This is not good. When you mouse over enemies in combat, you can see who they're targeting. And you can see that when I'm mousing over the wolf, you can see the targeting reticle appear on my wizard. So that currently, both of the wolves are attacking my wizard because my wizard is the closest enemy to them. And that was the first enemy they saw. So I have to get the... This is bad because the wizard has less health than my fighter. And I don't want her to get hit because she's also got a way worse deflection. This is the, um, something you have to understand. You have to be able to control the combat situation. And you do that through using positioning and also the engagement system, which I'll talk about a bit later on. So I have to um, fix this situation by moving my wizard. So um, instead of just rushing into combat, which I just did, what you should do is um, you should use stealth if you know an enemy is going to be up ahead or if you're in a hostile area. Stealth will uh, give you vision of the enemy before you see them. I think even if you've got no no points in stealth, you'll still um, be able to see enemies before they see you, which is very good because then you can set up your party in the correct um, positions and formations. You can set up your ranged characters to get in range, and then you can do a big alpha strike, which is uh, something I'll probably demonstrate in uh, later later videos about how to do that properly. Now. Instead of rushing into combat, I'm going to teach you to play sensibly because in Pills of Eternity, combat is punishing if you do not adhere to some very basic principles. The first of those I've already de uh, talked about is that um, you should try and set up on opponents in stealth and with um, and get into the right positions, which I didn't do because I'm an idiot, but that's what you should try and do in pretty much every single encounter where you're not forced um, into dialogue through into combat through dialogue or something like that. The second principle is to open combat with your per encounter abilities as alpha striking pills of eternity is very important and gives you a big edge in combat. I'm going to show you how, show you how to do that, but first I'm going to correct the mistake that I made with having my wizard in front yes. of my fighter. So I'm going to move my wizard back and need? move my fighter forward. Now fighters, um, if I want to change the targeting of the wizard, I have to engage the wolf. So I've actually got to target the wolf and use the engagement system. And I'm going to do that now. Now, I'm here. what I was talking about before is using per encounter abilities. Mm -hmm. The fighter has a knockdown ability, which is two per encounter, and it attacks the fortitude defense, uses her primary weapon, and if she hits, she, uh, she has a chance of knocking the enemy prone. It will make an attack against fortitude. So I'm going to knock down that wolf because I don't want the wolf to get to my wizard. Mm -hmm. when I, and what I'm also going to do is I'm going to use the arcane assault, which is a wizard's level one ability, and it is a per encounter that attacks reflex. And I demonstrated it before, but basically what it does is it does raw damage in a foe-only AoE, meaning you, you can cast it on top of your allies, and it also bypasses all DR. So it's always going to do between 12 and 19 damage on a hit. It will uh, do half damage on a graze and times 1.5 damage on a crit. It also dazes enemies for 8.4 seconds, and that makes them less accurate, reduces their dexterity and perception and their intellect, and also reduces their movement speed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpause and pause again. So now I can see that this wolf has 
is now targeting my um, fighter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move my wizard over here. Now, because my fighter is closer to um, the this wolf, it, sorry, because my fighter is closer to this wolf now, the wolf has retargeted my fighter, and there's a bit of a bug there with a double selection circle going on, probably because of the procedural blur. There we go. The procedural blur sometimes bugs out the selection circle. Okay, so now I've managed to get the wolves to retarget my fighter, and now I'm going to... Um, as you can see, the wolf has actually been knocked down. He's in mid-animation and falling over. And now I'm going to chuck my um, Ar Arcane Assault on top of the wolves. As you can see, both of their selection circles are now turning into a targeting reticule, but, but my allies isn't because this is a foe-only AoE. For some reason, it is coming up when I move out of the um, out of the center area, though. I think, I'm not, I think that's a bug because this actually doesn't do any damage to allies. So I'm going to queue that up now. So as you can see... I've hit both of those. Now I'm going to show um, the combat log. Okay, so if when I've got the game paused, I can look at the combat log on the right to see what's happening in combat. And the combat log has a lot of useful information. So you'll see that Kalisha engaged the young wolf in melee, which was what made that wolf stop to attack Kalisha and what's made the um, selection circles change. I'll talk about the engagement system in a second. The young wolf has engaged Kalisha back and Kalisha hit the young wolf for 13 slash damage and knocked him and knocked the wolf prone. So, as you can see, when you mouse over a combat log entry, it brings up a detailed um, uh, breakdown of what's actually happened. So, Kalisha's accuracy for that attack was 30. The wolf's deflection was 27. This, this gives Kalisha a plus 3 accuracy on top of her um, accuracy roll. Now, attack rolls in Pills of Eternity roll a random number between 1 to 100, and then add um, the attacker's accuracy, and then uh, subtract the defense of the enemy that's being attacked. And in this case, it was the wolf's deflection, which was 27. Kalisha's accuracy was 30. So she gets a plus three to hit on top of her roll. So it's 81 plus 84, which equals a hit. Now, there are four, as I said in part two, there are four attack resolutions in Pillars of Eternity. Miss, which is any roll between one and 15. Graze, which is any roll between 16 and 50. Hit, which is any roll between 51 and 100, and Critical Hit, which is any roll over 100. Now, as you can see, 84 falls into the hit range. And also, there are abilities in the game that uh, convert um, attack resolutions up or down one notch, and those are random chances to proc, so it doesn't matter what you rolled on it. If the random roll um, is... If, if the random chance occurs, it will just automatically convert it, and you'll see something in the combat log when that happens. Okay, so the base damage of um, Kalisha's knockdown was 17. The wolf's damage reduction was 4, so it's reduced her um, damage to 13 slash damage. She's then knocked the enemy prone, and then it, it shows all of the things that it's reduced uh, on the wolf, and then it shows the duration. So that wolf is now knocked prone for 5.5 seconds. Prone is awesome because it reduces their deflection, and makes it easier to hit, and they're also completely disabled. So I don't have to worry about that wolf at the moment. I'm going to switch targets to this one in a second. Now, this is uh, interrupts are also shown when they hit. Um, Kalisha's interrupt score is 6, and she rolled 68 plus 6 equals 74, which is greater than the um, constitution of the wolf, which is 72. So that means it's an interrupt. And I think the tooltip for that might be outdated, maybe. And uh, this is a, a line that probably shouldn't be there. It just says that uh, the wolf is knocked down. Now, as you can see, uh, when I've used the AoE ability, it has actually only pasted out one combat log line. Arcane Assault, three grazes and one hit. Now you can actually click on that combat line, combat log line to expand it. And then it brings up all of the things that happen. So the Arcane Assault grazed the, one of the young wolves for seven damage. Or actually 7.4 damage. Because um, the, uh, the get, damage in this game is uh, tracked in floats. So it does track decimal damage. So I did 7.4 damage to this wolf as you can see there. And I affected that wolf with the Dazed Affliction, which is a secondary attack. And as you can see, there's one entry for each. I affected the, the young wolf here for 10 damage. So if I mouse over that, I did, actually did 9.6 and it's been rounded up to 10 in the user interface. And I've affected that wolf with Dazed for 4.2 seconds. So it looks like I actually um, grazed the wolf on that Dazed as well. Yeah, I did. Okay, so that's basically what the combat log does. Now I'm going to unpause and I'm going to mm. use my second knockdown because, as I said, you should always use your per, knock, per, per encounters um, every, in every encounter and make sure you use them all up because there's just no reason not to. 
So I'm going to switch targets to this wolf because that wolf is disabled and I'm going to knock down this wolf so he can't do any damage to me. Yes. I'm also going to use my second uh, Arcane Assault. I'm not going to use any spells in this encounter because I don't need to. I'm going to win anyway. Okay, so now they're both knocked down. I'm going to... The, the next important thing to remember is to issue new actions to your characters after you've used an ability because depending on what auto attack setting you have or depending on how the auto attack works, your characters might just stand there doing nothing. So you, um, you have to be careful of that. So just every time you issue a, um, a command to a character and that the, the attack or whatever hits, make sure you go through your characters and just make sure that they're actually doing something. And that will be shown uh, in their recovery bar here above their head. Um, and if there is an icon inside the recovery, in, inside the combat HUD, uh, that means that they're currently doing something. These bars can be disabled by um, turning them off in the options menu, and they are only shown when you have the character selected or when you hold tab. So as you can see there, the health pips above their head represents their endurance, uh, and there are f five states of endurance. Full health, barely injured, um, injured, badly injured, and near death. So as you can see, there's one pip representing each of those. <coughs> you can also visually see the character's recovery uh, in the line below that. Now, um, I'll talk about the engagement system because it is uh, very important. Um, and that... Uh, the melee engagement system is a combination of an aggro mechanic. So as you as you noted before, when I attacked uh, the first wolf, the wolf stopped to attack my character. That's because um, when you engage an enemy, by default, that aggro's them to you. And it also ha the, the second component of the engagement system is an attack of opportunity. The aggro mechanic occurs when you hit. A unit in um, when a unit in melee has a melee weapon equipped. So if you've got a ranged weapon equipped, you don't qualify for engagement, and they have a free engagement slot. So characters can have multiple engagement slots, but by default, every character has one engagement slot when they have a melee weapon equipped. Uh, there are several. There, there is a talent called Hold the Line that adds an additional engagement slot, and there is a, an ability for the fighter to add more engagement slots as well. I think Defender and Hold the Line allows you to have I think maybe four or five engagement slots which is pretty good. So you can hold a lot of enemies to you as a fighter. Um, there are two ways that engagements will occur, and the first way is the enemy will run inside your engagement range, which is um, one meter in-game in, in size in invisible AoE. So it's somewhere around that distance. Um, and I think that only occurs if you have multiple engagement slots. When you've got one engagement slot, you have to actually issue an attack against the unit to engage them. But when you have, when when the fighter has multiple engagement slots, they will just automatically, and any enemy that runs in the AOE will just automatically start attacking them. And that, this is true of enemies and your characters as well. So if an enemy, if you run past an enemy fighter, your character, they will engage your character and they will automatically be aggroed. There is, and that's what um, this option is for in the game menu, disable party movement stop on engagement. This turns off the aggro part of the engagement system. So if you don't want your characters to be aggroed, you can turn on, on, you can turn on that option and it turns it off, but I would not recommend doing that. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, so when, when uh, engagements also can only occur when the unit is stationary. So if you are moving, you also won't qualify for engagements. If the, stany, if the stationary unit is one of your characters or one of your summons, the enemy will stop to attack, as I said, and your unit will also do the same. And um, once the enemy <coughs> that was moving stops to attack, they will then engage you, or you will engage them if um, the, it was your character getting engaged by an enemy. Engagements are represented by the spikes in the, um, in the, in the targeting reticules, as you can see there. There's a, the, the circle's thicker. And there is a spike. Now, there's a bit of procedural blur around the selection circles that ca is causing it to um, look like you're drunk, so seeing doubles. But the spikes in there, it means that the wolf is engaged. And when units are not prone, they don't, they, they, they can't engage anybody because they're disabled. So Kalisha is currently not engaged by the wolf because I knocked it down. Um, uh, now, this next bit is very important. Once you're engaged, if you try and move away, and by moving away, I mean simply clicking anywhere, um, even one pixel, you will suffer what's called a disengagement attack from every unit that's currently engaging you. This attack uses the pri primary weapon, and it is automatic, has yes. no animation, and um, 
uh, yeah, so it, it's auto, it's an automatic free hit from the enemy, and it can also play while uh, at a current animation is playing. So if you are currently in the middle of an attack animation against one enemy, you can um, score a disengagement attack on any unit you're engaging. It doesn't matter what your character is doing, as long as they have a melee weapon equipped, they can uh, score disengagement attacks against units they are engaging. Um, disengagement attacks have an accuracy bonus, so they're more accurate than a normal attack. And when a disengagement attack hits, you'll see a slash VFX play on the screen and you will take damage. Now, I'm going to unpause the game and I'm deliberately going to move away from the wolves to, to, to demonstrate what this looks like. And um, you will, if, if, what will happen is that um, the wolf will make a melee attack with their primary weapon against Kalisha. Uh, you'll see the slash VFX on the screen and this will end engagement whether the wolf hits or not. And there is a two-second cooldown for when you can re-engage an enemy from when they disengaged against you. Um, as you probably gathered, this means that using your natural inclination to move wounded units back is a very, very bad idea in this game. And I would strongly advise that no one moves their characters once they are engaged, unless they are facing a single weak enemy, or they are, st or you're standing in a persistent hazard uh, that deals huge damage, such as Ninagorth's freezing pillar, which does like um, damage per second if you're standing in a certain area of effect. Once you become more experienced with the game, you may end up finding situations where risking the disengagement attacks is not that bad, because, um, but you are giving the enemy a free attack against you, and this attack is free from recovery time, and it costs you health, which means you'll most likely have to rest sooner. Now, as I've been watching quite a few Twitch streams over the last few days, and pretty much every streamer I've seen has been getting destroyed by disengagement attacks. There are also several creatures in the game that can one-shot you, so disengaging from them may be a fatal decision. What I would recommend doing is either just killing the enemies uh, engaging you before you move or using a disable like knockdown, which was what I've done. So as what you can you see, need? I can move away and I don't, su yes. I don't suffer a disengagement attack. For some reason, oh yeah, I've got a sword equipped. Whoops. Uh, I'm going to switch weapons. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, or there are several um, abilities that you can use to break engagement. Rogues have rogues and wizards have abilities that allow them to break engagement. Um, the wizard has an optional talent called Grimoire Slam. If that hits, it like bashes the enemy with their book and knocks them back. Rogues have uh, escape and coordinated positioning, and they also have invisibility as well. So they've got a few ways to get away from enemies when they're engaged. Um, and other classes have. Um, abilities or there's a couple of talents to give you and uh, and items actually as well so that give you a bonus a defense bonus against disengagement attacks so if you if you have like a chanter um, chant on that you might give you a bonus against disengagement attacks there's a paladin aura that gives you a bonus against disengagement attacks there's cloaks to give you a bonus there's a talent called graceful retreat there's a few other things as well personally I don't think those are worth it in le except in very specific scenarios where you're stacking those bonuses on top of each other in some gimmick kiting build um, several other classes have abilities or powers that can disable enemies by knocking them prone stunning them paralyzing them petrifying them those all break engagement as well another thing that breaks engagement is interrupts and I showed you an interrupt before uh, up here so when Kalisha interrupted this wolf it broke the engagement from the wolf so if you interrupt an enemy you've got two seconds to get away but if you're engaged by multiple enemies you'll still get su you'll still suffer a disengagement attack from uh, the enemy that's still engaging you um, sometimes it's hard to see when an engagement has been broken because with lots of units on the screen and lots of visual effects flying in the round the screen can get visually rich so it can be hard to see what's going on sometimes so to correctly use the system to your advantage, you always need to try and keep your tanks and frontline characters in the front of your party and your other characters in the back because you don't want your squishy characters to be engaged. Unfortunately, this system leads to rigid combat. Personally, I, as an Infinity Engine veteran and a MOBA player, I don't really like the engagement system. In summary, don't disengage, break engagement instead. Mm. Okay, so now I'm going to um, go on to combat and I'm going to kill these wolves. I've got I've changed weapons with the Arbalest. Now, changing weapons has a two second cooldown by default. So I'm gonna have to wait two seconds before I can shoot that wolf. What you need? Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll show uh, the, these wolves can't engage me yet because I knocked them down. So I'm just gonna stop attacking. Um, oh yeah, I've got to got to showcase the hotkeys. Okay, so um, A is like attack on a net. Uh, a is an attack click. X is to cancel your action. So um, if I see how my I've got an attack icon there, 
if I press X, it cancels the action. So that means that I've just currently cancelled my action. And you can cancel the action before the hit frame. So if you're in the middle of a sword swing but you haven't hit yet, you can press X and it cancels it. You can also cancel spells in the middle of the spell cast before the spell has been cast and it doesn't use up the spell. It, um, so if, you, if you're casting a fireball and you're, one of your party members is going to run into the fireball, you can just press X and it will cancel it and you haven't used up the spell, that's fine, you can cast it again. Um, now, I think there's a few other hotkeys that I have to demonstrate as well. You can also queue actions. Um, so if I wanted, mm -hmm. to, I don't have any. Yes. So what I've got here is I'm going to make an attack with an arbalist. Now, if I wanted to cast a spell, I can hold shift, click on the spell, and drop the spell, and that will queue up the action. Uh, and then this is this will be very familiar to anyone who's played a MOBA. Um, and you can also shift click um, waypoints on the ground, and you can also queue up a string of abilities. So as you can see, that, that ability is now highlighted because it's in the action queue. The action queue is invisible, but there is actually an action queue in the game. You can also unselect and select uh, characters with control click. So if I want to select Kalisha, I What's can hold mean? control and click on her and it selects, her, selects her, um, both of the characters. And I can also unselect her with control as well. Okay, so um, I'm, mm -hmm. after I shoot my Arbalist, I'm going to cancel my action because I don't want to cast Grease. Um, I think I will cast, is that Ghost Blades? Thrust of the Tattered Veils, I'll cast that against, um, that wolf. Oh yeah, so I've got to, I've got to issue a new command to, oh yeah, disengagement attacks. Okay, so I'm going to, both of these wolves are engaging me, I'm going to move away. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so you see that slash on the screen? Um, now in the combat log, uh, the young wolf has missed Kalisha. So this, I think it was this one that missed, and this one's got, uh, Graze Kalisha for two damage and disengagement. That that doesn't seem very bad because these are like the weakest enemies in the game, or one of the weakest enemies mm -hmm. in the game. So I'm gonna switch back to my sword. Uh, that, switching weapons like this in combat's really bad, but I forgot to have my rod equipped, and I'm just trying to demonstrate the basics of combat. So as you can see, I've got to wait for the recovery. Okay, so now both of the wolves are down. Now to to loot uh, enemy bodies, you have to actually wait until the combat state ends. So, in the, as you can see, Kalisha's dis deactivated constant recovery, which is the fighter's natural endurance regeneration in combat. So, once you see that those abilities paste in the combat log, that means the combat state has ended, and you can loot the bodies. Now, as you can see, when I clicked on the wolf, um, it looted both of the bodies together. That's because, by default, Pillars of Eternity has an area loot system, kind of similar to Wasteland 2, but this can be uh, disabled in the game options. It's currently not available, but it will be available as a slider in this menu here. That's because it's coming in the day one patch, and um, the reason that you were able to disable it is because I and several others complained about the feature because I don't like area loot. Um, so mm. now, in, the, of course. In, in this main quest, I'm going to... Um, pick up these berries. Um, I'm not going to tell you why you have to do that, but I'm going to pick it up because I want to demonstrate um, the dial the game's dialogue with companions, and I also want to demonstrate um, the a couple of the things due, due to um, role-playing and background choices. So I'm going to pick up the berries. This is it. Okay, so now I'm going into a dialogue sequence. Okay, so the first thing that you'll note in this um, dialogue sequence is, in brackets it says, Aristocrat, this is my character background. Now in this particular dialogue, um, Kalisha will reference your character background. Now you can turn uh, these things off in, in the options menu if you don't want to know when she's referencing your background. So um, your background will come up in dialogue with characters at lots of <coughs> times in the game. This is one of them. So. Uh, Kalisha has an independent reply for every single background in the game. And she says, uh, so you're supposed to be one of the, um, someone from a big shot noble family because you're an aristocrat. Now, what you say in this conversation will uh, add, add to your biography. So um, what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, that isn't your business because I'm being an asshole. And um, this is a funny line. Suit yourself. Can't very well force you to have a personality, can I? Haha, <laughs> very funny whoever wrote that. And uh, as you can see, <coughs> descriptive text mixed with dialogue. Um, so this is just a, a dialogue that influences like what uh, part of your background. Um, I'm just going to go, I haven't given it much thought because I'm playing, I'm going to play a cryptic person just in this little sequence here. And then I think this one here also is a line that influences your background. So there's five choices. 
I hope to meet someone and fall in love, which is very ironic because there's no romance in the game. Ha <laughs> ha! So that's also a comic comedic line. I'm going to press that. I don't want to scare you, but by the way, some of these rule types. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Sideways teeth, etc., etc. Okay, let's get back to camp. Um, okay, so th this is a sequence in this particular quest. You have to go and find the guy that's uh, looking for water. For some reason, the text is overlapping up there. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my journal, and I'm going to check my um, biography. As you can see, <coughs> there is now a new line in the biography. Dreams of romance led you to venture to the deal foot and take up residence in Gilded Vale. That's because I picked that line in dialogue. And as you pick stuff, it will paste it into, into your biography, and it will automatically write itself over the course of the game. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this um, video up here. Um, in the next video, I'm going to showcase um, each individual class in combat and how the basics of using that class. So I've already I've already shown the basics of level one fighter and wizard. I'll probably still do another demonstration of those. These will be individual videos. They'll be short ones, just a few minutes long, with a couple of the encounters up ahead past this point. Before I go, I would like to address a post that I saw on 4chan boards from a few days ago by an anonymous user who used a Jerry Seinfeld picture. And uh, he was um, posting something about um, a video I made a while ago regarding um, testing, uh, glitching out, um, <coughs> changing range weapons outside of combat. Um, and I would like to say to that person, recovery time actually does apply outside of combat, but the recovery HUD is not shown because the combat state is not active. Um, so when you're not in combat, you can actually attack your own What's characters. Mean? Like that, as you can see, I just knocked out my character. I critted for 31 damage. Um, but Kalisha will still go into recovery time because, uh, but because when you attack your own characters, you're not in the combat state. You the combat hard is not actually shown. It used to be shown in an earlier beta build, um, but now it doesn't do that anymore because I think of a couple. Of, I think it was to do with a couple of exploits or whatever. So the same re uh, recovery time rules that are used in combat apply outside of combat as well. So that that's why um, it looked it kind of, it kind of looked like I was doing something dodgy in that video. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. Um, and I'll I'm gonna start. I'm oh, sorry I took so long to put this build up, but I've been very exhausted making these guides, and I'm gonna start doing the um, the character build guides, which is something that I think a lot of viewers have been waiting to see how to play the different character uh, classes in combat properly. And I'm going to get started on that um, tonight, and I'll be posting them up as I go. So probably over the next few hours, you'll see the first few uh, videos start coming up. Thanks for everyone who's been upload, um, upgrading my videos on Reddit, posting about them on 4chan, or the RPG Codex, the Obsidian Forums, Neo Gaff, the Steam Forums, all those kind of places. Um, the more people that we can get to uh, play Pills of Eternity properly, the better the game's going to sell, and that means that there'll be a higher chance of more expansions and more sequels and a bigger budget. This is only good for the game, and that's the reason why I'm making these guides. Thanks for watching, guys, and look forward to the next one.